Okay, gentlemen, if you have a Bible, are you be able to follow along on the screen? I want to just uh, talk about how to be an intentional father. So that's what this uh, session is about today. I'll probably go 35 minutes, 40 minutes, then I'll take a little Q&A on the back end. Uh, but I want to base it off this passage in Ephesians chapter 6. It is a signature text in the New Testament about fatherhood. It is one of the very few clear commands about the kind of fathers that we should be. So this is what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Over my studies, studying fatherhood, being a father, I have a son who's uh, 22. I have a daughter who's just about to turn 20. We're empty nesters now. Uh, I've been a pastor in New York City for the last 17 years and uh, really got passionate about the role of fatherhood when my son was two. When he was two years old, um, I was a youth pastor and I kept bumping into kids uh, when I was, I was a youth pastor at a church. And I kept bumping into these students on campus that were heads and shoulders above any other students. And I found out that they were Mormons. And I realized that the Mormons had a better strategy for the family than the evangelical church was implementing. And I got super convicted about that. And I basically asked the question, how do we build a pathway to raise up our kids uh, like the Mormons do. They've got an exceptional pathway. So it started me on this journey, 10 years, reading, thinking, processing, before my son turned 13. And I launched out on this vision of becoming an intentional father. And in my studies, I've, I've realized there's only five kinds of fathers that you're going to bump into in the world. The first kind of father is the irresponsible father. This father is basically a sperm donor. Shows up and then disappears. Now, this may happen out of selfishness, it may happen out of brokenness, it may happen out of cultural conditions, but this is, this is someone that has brought a life into the world but has not accepted responsibility to shape that life. And we know right now the epidemic of irresponsible fathers. Then you get ignorant fathers. And ignorant fathers are those that like do not know what they're doing. They don't understand developmental pathways, child psychology, they don't understand gentleness, forming a kid's heart. They just don't have the tools to get the job done. And then you've got inconsistent fathers. These are men who are normally torn by brokenness or ambition. And these are fathers who do a tremendous amount of damage in a kid because a kid can't map out what it takes to keep a father's attention and love. So half the time the dad is off killing it in the workplace while he's slowly killing his family. You've got a dad who's off dealing with his own struggles, sitting in the garage, listening to music from the 80s, stuck in his pain, can't figure out how to show up and get back in touch with his kid. An inconsistent father will do a lot of damage. And then you've got involved fathers. And this is your typical good American dad. This dad's having the sex talk. This dad's teaching the kid to drive. This dad's coming to most of the games. This is an involved father. And for the most part, our world is so broken that we don't have a vision beyond an involved father. I want to tell you, if you had an involved father, you're in a, the tiny percentage of men in the US. An involved father is a gift. There's something better than an involved father. And that's an intentional father. And let me highlight the difference. Uh, as a little bit about my story. When I was two years old, I was horrifically burned. And uh, they thought I wasn't going to be able to walk. They pulled me out of a, it's, it's a very long story, but they pulled me basically out of a cauldron of boiling water. And when they lifted me out of it, the skin fell off my leg. And uh, my mum said it radically altered my personality. Age two, I was in the burn unit for a long time. Uh, my earliest memories of my mum rubbing burn cream on my, uh, on my leg so I could keep some of my skin. And... Uh, it, the medicine was so strong, it rotted all of my baby teeth out. So if you see the photos of me when I'm a kid, I've got these little stubs of rotten teeth. Deeply impacted me. 
And uh, what it did is it produced within me uh, a fear, a insecurity that was very, very hard to explain. I think fundamentally what I was saying is the world is not a safe place. But I was also, when I was younger, very, very gifted. I was gifted at athletics. I was gifted at academics. And so I remember being playing basketball, being uh, the best and fairest on my team, uh, top of my class in school. And so I started to get this pattern in, in spite of these uh, challenges I faced of sort of overcoming and winning. And so my father would always come to me and he would always say this to me, don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Pride comes before a fall. Life is hard enough. You do not want God against you. God is opposed to the proud. Now, an involved dad is given that wisdom because those are biblically true principles. But if my dad understood my heart, my dad never would have said, don't be proudful to me. You know what he would have said? Get on the stage, do not shrink back. If he'd understood the dynamics of my heart, he would have realized I didn't struggle with overconfidence or arrogance. I struggle with fear and insecurity. And even to this day, I'm the guy you have to drag to the stage to take the mic, not the guy you have to fight to get the mic from and drag off the stage. Now, I've got enough self-awareness awareness and gifts to be a leader and be confident. But when I was a kid, the damage that happened in my heart because my dad didn't understand the specifics of my heart and the call of God on my life. My dad's a, a wonderful guy. We have a great relationship. But he didn't have a vision of how to be intentional. And here's the difference between an involved and an intentional father. An involved father deals with general biblical principles. An intentional father fights to understand the heart of the son or daughter that God has given him and builds an intentional personalized plan to raise them in the destiny that God has for them. And I want to tell you right now, that is an even rarer thing than involved fatherhood. So I want to just talk about three things today from this verse about how to become an intentional father. First thing is this, intentional fathers view their role as sacred. It's sacred. We take for granted uh, the role of fatherhood in our world today. We, we take it for granted. We think that uh, it's completely normal in history for men to take care of their children and raise them and love them and equip them, but it's not. Go back to the Industrial Revolution when children were working in factories or were chimney sweeps in England. The way we view children today is very, very different. And so if we're going to have a, a view of fatherhood as sacred, that means that we're going to have to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our fatherhood. Now, I, I, this is, this, so I, I come from a Pentecostal tradition. I'm from the Assemblies of God in Australia. So, you know, I don't care if someone shakes, speaks in tongues, spits or manifests. None of that stuff bothers me, okay? But sometimes Pentecostals have a theology and we only think the Holy Spirit's moving if the meeting's got mojo to it. And here's what we actually believe. We've got a theology of gatherings, not a theology of the kingdom. Because if the presence only shows up in Christian events, you're not walking in the kingdom. You've got power at Christian events. Now, the crazy thing about being filled with the Spirit as the New Testament commands us, Ephesians 5, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You know, that happens in Ephesians chapter 5. You know where this passage is? It's Ephesians chapter 6. And you know what that means? That the filling of the Holy Spirit is to have Spirit-filled husbands and wives and Spirit-filled fathers. And so you've got to be a Spirit-filled father. You should be expecting the gifts and wisdom of the Holy Spirit to inform and manifest the way that you parent your kid's heart. You ever ask God for words of knowledge about your children's destiny or their lives? You ever ask the Holy Spirit to give you dreams and visions for your kids? We always seem to do this for our church or for our business, but rarely do we apply the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit in our parenting. I remember very, very clearly uh, working with my son and uh, God would just tell me the sins he was committing. And I'd say, hey, how's it going, mate? He said, how do you know I said, young man, I don't know, but I want you to know you're a covenant child of the living God. You're in, you're in my lineage, man. You're in my story. And in my story, I'm a man of God, working with God, relying on the Holy Spirit, utilizing the gifts of the Spirit. You don't get to choose not to be in a Christian story. You can choose that when you're older. But right now, I got the Holy Ghost helping me parent you, young man. <laughs> the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the wicked and the righteous. 
I remember my son going to my daughter and saying, don't bother sinning. <laughs> They'll find out. <laughs> the beauty, the beauty of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will release power in your parenting. The Spirit will release gifts in your parenting. He'll release knowledge and insight. He'll release wisdom. So the first thing about an intentional father is this. They, they, they view their role as sacred and they rely on the sacred power of God to parent. Not just out of your own willpower, not just out of the last book you read, not just out of your own wisdom. God's going to show up, give you the keys to the kids' hearts that he's put into your care. It's a sacred role. Seneca said this, we slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, we plunge a knife into a sick cow, children born weak or deformed, we drown. That's how the Roman Empire viewed children. Tim Keller says this, we may not actually burn incense to Artemis, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a kind of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. We're offering our kids to the gods of secular culture in the same way that people did this in ancient Israel. It's a sacred and serious call to realize that God has entrusted us with the keys of releasing the destiny of the children in our homes. So we should have the love of God in our hearts and we should have the fear of God in our hearts over the responsibility that we are given. And ultimately, this is important because it is our job viewing this role as sacred to connect our kids' hearts with our heavenly Father. That's the ultimate goal of our parenting. It's to make our kids want to know Abba because of how we treat them. The Father, the Scripture says, was moved with compassion. And if our children don't see us move with compassion, how are they ever going to connect with their heavenly Father? If... Whenever a kid is growing up, and this, you know, listen, I can tell you right now, your kids have it harder than you do. You, you, so you may have to have walked up, uphill 10 miles in the snow with no shoes, carrying a backpack, weighing 140 pounds with your books. But I'm going to tell you, man, what a kid has to deal with is harder than what you had to deal with today. It is more complicated. It's more sophisticated. It's more available. It's more toxic. When some of you were young, in order for you to get pornography, you had to go find some, some uncle's playboys. Ten-year-old kids, imagine a, t imagine a porn factory showed up, moved in next door and built a tunnel into your kid's bedroom and your kid could go visit any time he wanted. That's what kids are dealing with their phones. The access is extraordinary. And uh, so, we, so kids are going to screw up. They're going to sin. They're going to deal with complications and challenges. And every time they sin, they're asking a question, what is Abba like? How you respond to their sin, whether you create cycles of shame, whether you make them hide out of fear. That was the, that was the perfect statement this morning. My whole goal parenting with my son was for my son to be able to say, my dad can help me with this. He said, if you're in a car and your friends are smoking weed and the police pull you over, you don't need to think, man, my dad's going to kill me. You need to think, let me get my dad on the phone. He can help me with this. That's the ultimate goal, that the Father does not abandon us in our sin, that the Father is committed to raising us as sons who can steward his kingdom on earth. And we have to view a sacred role of helping our kids see our heavenly Father. We need to be the ones that cut off the repentant speech, clothe them, with robes of recognition, put the sandals back on their feet, put a ring on their, their finger and tell them, you don't have to live as a servant in my house. You can live as a son again. Got to take, got to take this with a, a sacred responsibility. You feel that? You feel that. But we need a generation of dads to feel that. Second thing, intentional fathers, they deal with their own brokenness so they don't pass it on to others. Ronald Rollheiser says this, whatever pain is not transformed is transferred. That's true. This word to exasperate means to anger or to arouse to wrath. And a lot of times we've got the best of intentions. You come back from an event like this and you're like, yes, Lord, this is the year. This is the year of breakthrough. This is the year of transformation. And that stuff's amazing until the pressure comes. What pressure reveals what's truly under there. That's what COVID did. It revealed who we really are when we're disoriented and we're pushed 
and our freedom's taken away and we feel like we've got no control or no direction. And this will happen in your parenting. I remember my, uh, you know, so I'm a pastor and um, my kids were often, you know, be with me on the train or walking to church when I go to preach. And I had to tell my kids, like, look, don't do bad stuff on Saturday night because i got to preach on Sunday. Like, don't give me drama. And uh, sure enough, they always give me drama. And I remember once, like on Sunday morning, getting super stressed out, and my daughter just gave me this uh, passage back. She's like, well, Dad, whatever pain is not transformed is transferred, and I just want you to know that your anxiety is filling our house. <laughs> so it's true. Pressure is a revealer of what's in you. An attention to father's got to deal with their wounds. Got to deal with their wounds. Men are deeply wounded. Many of us are deeply wounded. Some of you are wounded by a comment you heard in the fourth grade. You've never gotten over it. Some of you are wounded by what your wife said on your honeymoon. You've never forgiven her. Some of you are wounded by something a boss said or a church leader said to you. You've got a lot of men walking around who are wounded. And the problem with a wound, if it's not tended to, is it becomes toxic. The Bible says uh, you've got to see to it that no bitter root springs up, defiling many. A man with a wounded heart will leak toxicity around him when the pressure comes. This ultimately results in an orphan spirit. And the orphan spirit is an unblessed man trying to strive and find his way into the world. And a man who is not ministering from blessing will scheme to get blessing. We see this in the story of Jacob. Jacob's name means supplanter, schemer. Joseph was surrounded and loved female energy. His brother was the one that was out in the woods hunting, hairy. Jake, Jake, did I say Joseph? I meant Jacob. Jacob, Jacob was at home and uh, he was mum's boy. And mum was like, you're unblessed, but let me go. I'll steal the blessing for you from daddy. I'll go get it for you. Well, I don't know how to get it. He had a mother's blessing, but not a father's blessing. And so as a result, what would happen to him? He was the soft-skinned one, not the hairy one. He was the one that mummy said, let me go make a pot of stew like daddy likes it. And he puts a coat on pretending to be somebody he's not. And he has to go in and sneak a blessing, steal a blessing. And for the rest of his life, he knows he's got a blessing that he doesn't belong and so he goes off, and what's the story of his life? He becomes a schemer. This is the pattern. And now he begins to reap and sow, and it's a horrific story. Meets a beautiful woman, and he's like, yes, please. And the dad says, okay, um, let's do a little bit of labor, and you can have my girl. And here's what then, so he gets Rachel, but here's what we know about Leah. She had weak eyes. Rachel's lovely in shape and form. You get the picture. And then she's got that sister with the weak eyes. You also get that picture. Then what ends up happening? He's a schemer and he's unblessed. And so now because he has stolen a blessing, he starts to reap the dysfunction and scheming that's in his life. And so now he's got this in his marriage. And then when he runs off and then he starts to scheme with the cattle and he runs off again and now he's worried when he goes to reconcile with his brother. I mean, this is a whole story of scheming until he comes to that moment. You know what that moment is when the angel of the Lord appears to him? And he wrestles with the Lord. And what does the Lord? He says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's got a blessing, but it's not a real blessing. It's a stolen blessing. It's a schemed blessing. And then he starts wrestling with God. And he goes, I can't do the rest of my life. I cannot inherit promises from a scheming spirit. I've got to receive these from a spirit of blessing. And so ultimately what ends up happening? He gets blessed, but he gets the limp. For the rest of his life, he walks with a limp, knowing the blessings cost him something, but it's authentic. He gets a new name, and he becomes the father of a nation. And you know how his life ends? Leaning on a stick, blessing grandchildren. What an image. But he could not do that until that wound of the false blessing was healed by wrestling with God. And some of you guys, some of you guys are schemers because you've never been truly blessed. You've had the blessing of finances. You've had the blessing of women giving their sexuality to you. You've had the blessing of church uh, insider categories where they let you in because of your success. But in your spirit, you know you're a schemer. And here's what God says. Let me give you a new name so that you can become the father of the nation that you want. And so this is one of those moments where we've got to wrestle with God and it's painful and you'll walk with a limp. 
for the rest of your life, but you'll have a blessing you know belongs to you. So you gotta, you got to wrestle this stuff down. I appreciate those golf claps. I felt that was, uh, if we're going to clap, we're going to clap. I'm not doing golf claps. Yeah. Got to get the spirit of adoption. Wanted, chosen, loved, and an heir. When you know you've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus, you don't need a scheme for earthly blessing. All you have to do is learn how to steward the inheritance that is already yours through Christ. Romans 8 says the spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves again to fear, but it's that spirit of adoption. And by that, we cry, Abba, Father. That's a strong word in the Greek, the cry. It's not dad. It's dad. It's a cry. It's a primal urge coming out of the spirit towards your father. Jesus could handle the rejection of the world because he had the favor of the Father in his life. Jesus' first words out of his mouth were, I've got to be about my Father's business. And Jesus' final words on the cross were, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. Jesus' life was framed by confidence and intimacy with the Father. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks of the Father 17 times. In the upper room discourse, John 14 through 16, he's going to mention the Father 46 times. And when he's in the great high priestly prayer in John 17, he's going to mention the Father another seven times. Because he had the spirit of adoption within him as the beloved son, he could handle any rejection of the world and he was free to give his life away for others. And so until a man knows his true sonship and who the Father is in his life, all he will pass on is scheming and wounds to his children. But when a man knows who he is, when a man is healed in his spirit, When a man has a blessing from the Father and he is ready to parent out of that spirit, you know what's going to happen? He won't pass on generational curses. He's going to pass on generational blessing. And his inheritance will have an acceleration because they won't have the baggage of the past. An intentional father takes their wounds and their healing and the role of blessing and sonship extremely seriously. And here's the third thing here. Intentional fathers build a plan and a pathway for their kids' formation. Plan and a pathway. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction. These are two interesting words. Instructions, a little bit more about content. Training is that application. Wisdom that was talked about earlier. In a room, have you ever studied how kids were raised in, in a household in Rome? When they were little, they were given to uh, their mother. The mother basically nurtured them. Then they were given to a tutor or a tutor, a tutor. Uh, and what the tutor would do is basically give them all of the, the raw content of a Roman worldview. And when the tutor had done their best, the kid was handed over to his father. And the father taught the son the realm and the relationships of their family. Here's what we carry. Here's what we have. And here's who we do this with. And so they went through a very elaborate process over the course of time where the son could come to the meeting, but he couldn't talk in the meeting. Then the son could come to the family meetings and the business meetings, and he could ask questions in the meeting, but he couldn't give answers in the meeting. And ultimately over the course of time, there'd be a moment of transfer where the father would hand over the inheritance and the legacy towards his son. Romans took raising their children seriously. The Jewish community had a massive vision. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Note the connection between the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, immediately followed with a cult of fatherhood. They're connected in these things. And it's going to say that when you disciple your kids, you've got to get this into them when you sit, when you stand, as you're walking along, write it on the walls, put it on your forehead. This is an immersion into the ways of God into the world. Here's what Josephus said about the Jewish understanding of fatherhood around the time of Jesus. Our ground is good and we work work it to the utmost, but our chief ambition is the education of our children. We take most pains of all with the instruction of children and esteem the observation of the laws and the piety corresponding with them the most important affair of our whole life. You wanna know why the Jewish community have prospered for thousands of years without a homeland? 
A, fear of God, B, the Sabbath, and C, a vision of how they raise their children. Almost every Jewish father, particularly in conservative Judaism, is an intentional father. They take this so seriously. Here's how we raise kids in America. We overschedule them with second tier, third soil priorities. They learn about sexuality from Pornhub, life skills from YouTube, and how to interact with other people on social media. Where are the fathers in the home raising their children? Now, you may say, John, this sounds a bit intense. Well, can I just tell you right now, you know what the stats are on how evangelical kids do in an evangelical home? Almost 70% of kids raised in evangelical homes abandon their faith their freshman year of college. So here's what I want to say. How many of you, if, if I was to say, folks, I want to invite you in a little business venture, I've got a 70% failure rate. Seven out of the 10 of the locations I open fail. Who's in? You'd say, man, you need, a, you, need a, you need a better strategy. You need a better board. You need better leaders. Why is it then when it comes to raising our children, we're not reevaluating our entire process because everything we've done to this point is leading to generational failure. This year, 1.2 million kids will walk away from their faith and deconvert. We've now reached a point of decline sociologically in the US church where bar radical youth discipleship or an old time Holy Ghost societal revival, all you will do for the next 30 years of your life is manage the decline of the American church. That is the natural destiny of this generation. Bar some men standing up with a different vision and taking action. So when people tell me what you're advocating is intense, I say, you wanna know what's intense? Having a prodigal in your home, that's intense. You know what's intense? Weeping with mums who are losing their kids. That's intense. Pick your pain. Pick your pain. Pick your hard. Pick your decisions. You've got to have a plan for the faith. You've got to rebuild the family altar. You've got to be a priest in your home, man. You've got to lead your kids in prayer. Well, I don't know how to do it. Listen, if you don't know how to do it, do it on their behalf. One of the greatest lines in the book of Job, Job would come behind his kids and offer a sacrifice just in case they sinned. We've got to, we've got to get fire back on the family altar. One of the things when you study historic revivals, which is one of my life passions, I've traveled the world going to sites where historic revivals have happened. Many of the revivals happen because the kids have the Ten Commandments in their heart out of memory and they've violated all of them. But when the Spirit of God comes in power, they're cut to the heart by the law of God they heard as children. Modern evangelical churches have curriculum like this. Jesus wants to be your forever friend. And look, I'm sure he does. But if you don't have the word of God in the kid's heart, there's nothing to revive. There's cheap slogans from consumeristic Christianity that do nothing to impart the love and fear of God. Then we've got to care about the family culture that we have. Culture is interesting. It comes from two, uh, two words for culture. One is cultus which is, means to venerate, it's a religious term. Like a cult is a charismatic figure with everybody, you know, the women, the economics, the attention, all revolving around one person. And then cultura is a Latin word that means to cultivate. It's a farming metaphor. And so a culture is whatever is put at the center and considered sacred, and then whatever is springing up around it in service of it. And so when a family, when a man says, I'm going to build my family culture, he's going to determine what's at the center and what gets attention and nurture so that a crop is produced with it. And so we need men who put Jesus back at the center of their homes. We need men with convictions then to cultivate around that family altar practices and habits and love and joy and adventure all around living in the way of Jesus and not the way of the world. And then if this happens, you know what you'll build? you build a family immune system. A healthy family has an immune system that when rebellion comes in, oh man, you might get a cold or even the flu, but by the time that's dealt with, you'll be able to recover. And so many families don't have an immune system. That's what, that's, COVID was a predator, predator virus. It preyed on weakness. You can build a strong enough family immune system to repel the effects of pornography, to repel the effects of violence, to repel the effects of brokenness and dysfunction. But that takes work to build something that healthy. And that's why an intentional father sees this like the Romans did, like the Jewish community did, as the most important legacy he has. 
And then lastly, they build a formation pathway. A formation pathway. I came up with this thing called the primal path. And I, this is, I did this for my son. I called it the primal path because I was trying to motivate a 13-year-old kid to get out of bed for an hour every morning and be discipled for six years. And I thought if I called it like a, a discipleship pathway to help you become godly, he would have been like, no, nah, I'm good. So I wanted to sell like I had a little bit of teeth, a little bit of dirt, a little bit of blood in it, the primal path. And here's what I basically realized uh, in discipling this is that every society, almost like a divine blueprint in history, except late modern Western society, had a pathway for forming men. I want to put this, this let's go to the next one here. I just want to show you the pathway that this is, this is almost universal. Number one, they had a society for the common good, which basically means there was a collective sense of us. America, America has, is, uh, I want to be careful here, I'm a US citizen by choice, so don't be hating on me. I chose to be here, okay? But I can say hard things about it because I'm not fully from here, but I also want to be here, okay? Uh, America is broken, probably irreparably. And it's broken because of what sociologists call an, an imaginary society. And here's what I mean by this. No, it's, it's not what you think. An imaginary society says this, that a 16-year-old African-American young man in Mobile, Alabama, and a 48-year-old unemployed former trucker who was in the Marines in Seattle, when they close their eyes and say, I'm an American, they have a thing they can imagine that holds them together in spite of their difference. And now we live in a society when they close their eyes, we cannot imagine a shared future or, or, or a common past. So it's gone. So we used, to have a, we used to have a society for the common good. And that society meant that there was aspirations of nobility and honour for participating in that society. They realised if they didn't get men on board with this vision, the society would burn down. Next slide. So this is what they had. They had a, rem- a conscious ceremony or removal of the childhood environment. And sometimes this was violent. In some societies, as you know, all the men would show up at the village door and they say, bring out the son of our people. Imagine that one. Like, uh, yo, is Tommy home? Mum's like, Tommy's not home. You're like, Tommy's home. We see him in the room. Bring Tommy up. There's like 80 men from the church. Yo, Tommy, you ready to get initiated? Yo, Tommy, you circumcised yet, bro? We're just checking. We don't even know what's going to happen. You baptised? You got a tattoo? And Tommy's terrified in his room. And mum's like, Tommy's not coming. And then dad comes out and is like, Tommy, it's time. The men need you. Some of these things were crazy. Sometimes they would do false burials where they'd bury the kid up to his neck like he was dying to his childhood. You go back and you read this. It's wild. It was a severing of the, a removal of the child environment. Next. A severing of childhood thinking. Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I acted like a child. But now that I've become a man or I'm becoming a man, I put away childish things. America says you never have to put away child, childish things. You can be a child at 34 years old. And have, all that will happen is people go, way to go, bro. I mean, there's, just, there's no moment where we put to death our childhood thinking. Next slide here. Here's what would happen then. The community of men would do formal training and formation for the men around three areas. Number one, the religious story of their people. Here's the God we believe, the God we serve, and how to be in covenant with Him. Number two, here are the skills you need to prosper as a man in the society. So a lot of it was about skill acquisition. And the number three, it was about the character that was required in order for you to be held in honour by the other men in our community. Here's the thing, we all know this. Honour cannot be bestowed by women, it's only bestowed by men. A thousand women can honour a man, but if a man walks into a room and the brothers don't recognise him, it's all been in vain. And so this this sense of bestowal of honour by the community of men, honour the life of the man. Next, he is sent out for the ordeal. That's Many of the societies call it this. In Australia, for young Aboriginal men, they'd send them out for six months into the outback to survive on their own. Every society had an idea. And here was the point of the ordeal. It was to get get the young man ready to understand that he would have to stand on his own one time. The ordeal was designed to test whether or not he had it. And if a man didn't pass the test, in many cultures he'd die, many other cultures he'd get another, another shot at it. But if the man passed the ordeal for the rest of his life, he would carry confidence knowing he had what it took and the men had recognised him. Next slide here. 
This then, would he would be brought back into the community and recognised by the men. And then lastly, he would be reintegrated. Next slide. He would be reintegrated to society for the common good. Now, I want to I ask you a question. Show me this in Christianity. Show me this in the modern world. Here, here's what you get. Dad's doing a few camping trips. Well, I love a good camping trip. And if you've done one, I honour you. But a camping trip is not enough to form kids in the culture that we live in. Well, what about youth group? Barna's latest study, 80% of people who attend evangelical churches do not have an evangelical worldview, which means eight out of the 10 of the leaders are even around your kids don't even think properly about who God is and how the world should be. So where are we going to come up with a movement like this? And so this became the great passion of my life. And this is the thing I did with my son. This is what I called the primal path. So I came up with a six-year discipleship journey from 13 to 19 to help my son get ready to move into adulthood. First slide here, this is us. Uh, we did a baptism. I did it with a little cohort of dads and sons. That's my son on the end there in the gray T-shirt. And uh, we basically took him out to the beach and gave him this like terrifying speech and uh, pretty decent rite of a passage that resulted in them stripping off and running to the ocean as a baptized uh, journey into liminal space. And I spent a year psyching him out that it was coming when he turned 13. And when he turned 13, he was ready. And then every day, next slide here, every day here, we get up in the morning. And I basically do this. I talk about the skills he needed to prosper as a man, the relationship with God he needed, and the character he needed in life. We do this every morning. And then we do a thing called man school. And man school was one night a week. I teach him one thing you need to do to be able to be a man. How to cook a steak. How to change a tire how to ask a girl out. And every week, man school had homework. Nate, you got to go ask the prettiest girl in your school out. She's going to say no. Oh, of course she is, bro. I don't want to be rude here. Let's be real. <laughs> know thyself. The point is to, get, is, is to break your fear of women. So let me know when you've done it, and then we can carry on. Sure enough, asked the prettiest girl out. She said, no, but I appreciate you asking me. I said, how was that? It's terrifying. How was the rejection? He goes, not bad. I said, what did you learn from that? He's like, don't be intimidated. I was like, there you go, man. Let's move on. Just loading him up with skills to be able to navigate the complexities of life. Next slide here. Uh, every day we'd have these categories of content that we would work through. Now, people do this for high school. You've got to know certain amounts of school before you go to the next level. Why don't churches do this? Why don't dads do this? Why don't dads take all the knowledge that they've got and build it into a curriculum to form their own sons? Next one here. This is, this is one of the most potent moments of my life as he's growing up. You can see behind him, that was my initial brainstorm on building this discipleship journey. And I was sitting there with my son and one day he said, Dad, I'm loving the primal path, man. This is changing my life. But I've got a question for you. Who took you through this? I said, no one took me through this, man. No one. And he said, well, where did this come from? I said, it came from two places, man. It came from my head and it came from my heart. I said, I've designed this for you because you're my son. And I don't want to pass on my drama. I want to pass on blessing to you. I want you to go further and farther than I've ever been in my life. So all of this I've designed for you. And he cried and he said this, Dad, I've never felt so loved. I thought, what a moment, man. I don't ever remember as a teenager feeling loved. I knew I was loved positionally, but I never felt that impact. Next slide. Uh, I sent him on a gap year. I said, I don't want my son to go straight to college and lose his faith. I don't want my son to go straight into the lion's den. I said, I want my son to see the world so he's not a spoiled American kid for the rest of his life. And I want to irreparably break his heart for the global church and the global poor. So he did a gap year and he went around the world into some of the poorest communities on earth. And uh, it was amazing what happened when he, when he went, went with a, a, an amazing organisation that facilitates this, went with a, a tribe of young men. They, they get together every year for an annual reunion. And uh, the stuff I couldn't get out of him, you remember that last habit? There was still a bit, a bit of stuff left after all my efforts. And it was still there, two weeks with his bros in South Africa. And then and, and it all comes out because the other guys are like, hey, bro, you suck right there. You don't want to tell you that? He goes, my dad told me that for six years. And he came back a different person because he'd seen the world and he could not reduce his vision and his passion back to that of partying and promiscuity in an American college experience. 
And then ultimately, to close it out, we did a 500-mile hike, the Camino de Santiago across Spain. And a lot of these events, when, they, when you get done with them, like the kid's like, he's not prepared to re-enter. So we took 33 days retracing the 33 years of Jesus' life on earth, recapping our six-year journey, getting ready for him to come off. And at the end of it, I designed this ceremony of blessing. And I had all the men who'd spoken into his life over these six years write in these really heartfelt letters, exhortations and wisdom. And, and the Camino de Santiago, what you're supposed to do at the end of it, you carry something. And at the end of it, in this town called Finisterre, you burn it on the beach and you leave it behind and the pilgrimage is complete. And so we worked this. And at the end of this pilgrimage was my son leaving behind his childhood being blessed as a man. And here's the photo of this happening right now. This is my son running out of the water. And as he's running out, I yelled over, who is this man that emerges from the water? Ladies and gentlemen, behold the man, Nathan Tyson, that comes out. It's one of the most sacred moments of my life. So if you were to ask my son the question that all men ask, how do you know that you're a man? My son would say this, when I was 13, I was initiated into a multi-year process with a community of men. I was taught who to be, how to be, and what to do. I went on a pilgrimage to shape me. I was tested in an ordeal. I hiked across Spain on a, on a, a pilgrimage of consecration. I burned my childhood on a beach in Spain and I emerged with the blessing of a community of men. Now, my son's not perfect, but he is a man. He's not perfect, but he is a man. I did a separate thing for my daughter that I called 50 pieces of my heart. 50 key deposits every father has to put in his daughter's heart before she leaves home. But I don't have time to talk about that. So here's what I want to say. Now, I, now how many of you are like, man, that was, that was a cool six-year journey. Next slide here. You probably think that it went like this. Yeah, man, it's childhood. And then you're doing these morning devotions and you're doing man school and you're taking these amazing trips. And it's like, and then now he's an adult. Next slide here. This is what it looked like, just to give you a little bit of hope right there. Oh my gosh, a freaking disaster. Let me tell you, man. <sighs> Roll Heiser says this, the journey out of adolescence is rarely serene. That is true, man. We went through some wild stuff. My son said, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to follow Jesus. Started dating a girl I didn't like, led him astray. And, um, you know, the whole time I'm super casual. I'm Australian. Yeah, man, you don't want to follow Jesus. I understand that. Kurrat, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I buy this. But in, in person, super easy. Yeah, man, no worries. Let's just keep talking, working it through. Prayer, fasting, breaking down strongholds and renouncing this relationship, breaking soul ties in the heavenlies, going in hard. It was just some hard stuff in there. That it was, it's worth it. Now here's the thing. Some people say to me, man, that's intense. What would you do if you had your time again? Do you want to know my honest answer? I'd go harder. I would have done more. I would have been more intentional because our window is closed. Now we're in adult friendship. Now we're talking about who he's going to marry and what he's going to do with his life and how he's going to make a living. It's different. But I'd do, I'd do it all over again a little bit harder to get, uh, you know, you know what I'd give for another 100 hours with my son? To be able to take another trip like that when he was 15. Now, some of you are like, it's too late. What do I do? Well, that's another session completely. I want you to know that the heart of the Father can redeem anything. It's never too late. But I will say this. We're in a moment. You know, we read the story in the Bible, the story of the, the prodigal son. And this is a story where the son says, I want my inheritance, and he runs away and squanders his life. But I want to tell you right now, we're not living in an age of the prodigal son. We're living in an age of the prodigal fathers. And we've got fathers who've run away. We've got fathers who've run to their careers. They've run out of brokenness. We've got fathers who've run away. And you know what? It's the sons of this generation who are welcoming their fathers home. And this is the movement that I carry in my heart. It is a movement of prodigal fathers returning home to a waiting family who wants them. And that's the message. That's the message. We need prodigal fathers to come home, to take the intentionality they have for their business and do it to their children. 
We need dads who take all their strategic skills when they launch stuff and apply it to their daughter's hearts. We need dads who have all of their mojo and energy and their, all of their hobbies and all of their fun. They need to carve off a little bit of that. They need to give it back to their kids and bring joy to their lives. We need prodigal fathers to come home to waiting sons because here's the thing. Your kids will always take you back. Your kids will run down the road. They'll forgive you for your immaturity. Your kids, by the grace of God, will forgive you for your sexual brokenness. Your kids will forgive you for squandering your inheritance and they'll let you back in to rebuild something beautiful if you're willing to come home in the grace of God. We need a movement of intentional fathers calling back prodigal fathers so this generation can be saved. Amen. Amen. Two things I want to say. Not done. Appreciate that. Two things I want to say. Number one, up here, I send out a weekly email for fathers and men. And uh, if you want to get totally free, and uh, if you just want to get a thought every week, I just did a five-part series on how a man is formed on male formation. And um, hopefully this will bless you. And uh, the second thing I, I, I want to say here um, is just, I think we've got six minutes for questions. So this is, we don't have any time for I can I can see it. We don't, folks, we don't have time for questions. Can I pray over you? Can I just pray over you and perhaps we'll close out with that? Okay. Everybody stand up. Yes. Uh, open your hearts right now to receive this Amen. blessing from a, from a father in the faith. Yes. So, Father, we come into your presence right now. Jesus. We thank you that your word says we can come with freedom and confidence because of the blood of Jesus. And, Father, I just want to pray right now against any shame that may have been triggered or accumulated over the years. Father, we just renounce the spirit of shame in the name of Jesus. Father, you have destined every one of these fathers to lead with integrity so they can stand with their head held high because of how they've loved and served. And so Holy Spirit, I just wanna pray right now that you would just bring a fresh mantle of fatherhood upon them. Lord, I pray for a movement of spirit-filled fathering. Lord, I pray for power to close those gaps where kids feel distant. Lord, I want to pray right now you will release the gifts of the Spirit, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of revelation, miracles in prayer, financial provision, whatever they need to take this primal responsibility seriously, Lord God. Father, I just want to pray that you will bind the enemy from our homes. Lord, I love that word earlier of the vultures coming to steal the covenant. Lord, we just renounce those vultures trying to steal our time, our energy, our vision, our heart, our motivation from building covenant homes for the glory of God. Father, we rebuke the evil one from our homes. We say he has no place. We cover our families in the blood of Jesus. Lord, all we have and all we are, we consecrate to You. We pray that our homes, Lord, would be hospitals of healing for a broken generation. Lord, we pray our sons and daughters would go farther than we've ever dreamed ourselves. Lord, remove any insecurity that lingers in our hearts because we don't think we have what it takes. Lord, we already have everything we need for life and godliness. We have the Spirit of God within us, an eternal inheritance that's kept and stored for us that cannot be taken. And Lord, we have Your heart within us to obey Your Word. So I just pray power, anointing, blessing, favour on the hearts of my brothers who are here, Lord God. I pray miracles in relationships would be restored and flow from this session. Lord, I just, I just pray in the name of Jesus, fathers and sons reconciling because of our time here together. Lord, generational healing, generational blessing released. And Lord, we declare these things because we know it's Your will, because we understand Your heart and Your Word. So we pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you.